Oh, we're back. We're back. We're really back. Good evening. This is Dr. Misha Griffith. She's the smart one. Okay. And this is Dr. Uh, it's Dr. Not Dr. <laughs> I'm not. Jerry Griffith, he's the talented one. All right. We're here tonight. We're doing kind of a little less preparation than we normally did because, well, we needed time to... Re because we were out shopping for a new car, let's be honest. <laughs> okay. So, but what we wanted to do was take a few minutes and just have kind of a casual conversation. We don't have quite the organized outline that we do last week or that we will next week. So we're calling it just kind of a history hangout. Still want to just chat about a couple things, a little follow-up, things we didn't quite catch up on last week, and mm -hmm. uh, basically waste our time. And talk a little bit about the future, what's coming up. That's hope. not history. Well... Kind of, it is. Okay. So, go ahead. What can we do? What can we do? Well, last week we talked about the Reconquista. Reconquista. Love that and word. we got, and we, we you, your high school Spanish comes in so handy. Um, and last week we didn't get to everything we wanted to get to. I don't know if we... We didn't really get to... to one of the things I wanted to, to touch on, because we were trying to debate, you know, the ultimate question is... Right. Was the Reconquista really a good thing historically? And of course, that's from whose perspective. Right. But um, should we narrow down the time period we're talking about? Okay. Well, you mean bring people up to speed? Those who weren't watching. Yeah. Previously on History Unsettled. <laughs> so we talk a lot about the development of Moorish Spain, and from 711 until 1492, at least part of Spain was under the control of people who were called the Moors. Some of them were just as Spanish as modern Spaniards, but they were a Muslim-dominated society right. until at the end in 1492, they were driven out completely. Right, by Ferdinand and Isabella. And one of the things that we talked about in quite a bit of detail last week was it seems that there's some mythos built up. We've got two different attitudes on Muslims in this world. Right. One, they're all bomb-throwing terrorists. Right. Or two that there was this golden age of tolerance and peace in the Middle Ages where they respected everybody. And, and, and we found that neither one of those are really true. No, it was basically a, a mixture of both. It was an unusual time in that you had three separate religious traditions living somewhat peacefully. Well, they were living peacefully so. from, from time to time. And one of the things that we talked about was the, uh, come on, I'm trying to find my pictures. But it very much depended upon the quality of the ruler. Who? This guy. Oh. That's right. Washington Irving. <laughs> Washington Irving, uh, who, by the way, is the reason why some people still talk about the flat earth. Um, in the time of Columbus, and we're going to talk about Columbus in a minute, right. no person with any brains. Educated person. Even semi-educated person believed that the world was flat. Washington Irving wrote a novel about, wrote a, a biography of Columbus in which he created this mythos about Columbus thought the world was round, but everybody else thought the world was flat. Right. Anyway, Washington Irving created that mythos, but he also spent a lot of time in Spain. In okay. He actually spent time in Spain as the as Sorry. the ambassador, okay, he actually spent time in Spain as the as Andy Jackson's Andrew Jackson's ambassador to Spain, uh, and he wrote extensively about it. He was already a fairly well known writer at this point, so it's not like he was um, uh, a nobody. He was very well known at the time, and so consequently, he uh, wrote a book uh, entitled Tales from the Alhambra, or sometimes just called the Alhambra. And it was a fairly popular book, but he talks, he, he writes about his travels. He writes about going through Spain at a time when there's bandits uh, around every corner and, and having siestas. And, and, and it was, it's this strange little stereotypical journey. Um, Obviously, the man was an author, and he was telling. He was most interested in telling a good story, not in doing a very uh, in-depth anthropological survey of what's happening in Spain. That's not what he felt his audience wanted. And by the way, I'm back. I apologize. Batteries died. That little sound was. Well, we're making sure everybody's awake. Is it? 
we're back. Oh, okay. actually, I'm peeking a little bit. Okay. Um, but anyway, I wanted to talk for a second about what happened after the Reconquista. Because right. suddenly you had Spain, a uh, picture of Spain here. Spain was in some ways, and she's going to argue with me on this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Spain was in some ways the first large modern nation. Now, she's before she attacks me, let me mm -hmm. just say that for a nation that size, France at this time was very divided up. England was a mess. Um, much of Europe. Now, there was, of course, Russia, which was big and spread, and China, which is not really part of this discussion. Right. But the first modern state of that kind of scale and size and that much diversity that was now unified, and at this time, England was going through, was just finishing up the War of the Roses. Italy was a whole mess of city-states. You've got all of this stuff going on, but at this moment, Spain was together, was unified, and could do things as a unified nation. Okay. I wouldn't even dare use the name nation. Nation specifically talks about the nature of citizens uh, to where they live. And quite frankly, none of the people in this Iberian Peninsula we now know as Spain thought of themselves necessarily as being citizens of Spain. They were subjects. They had been subjects of the Muslim overlords, now they then they were subjects of various Spanish rulers, the kingdoms of Navarre, Castile, Aragon. These were separate kingdoms. Oh, and Portugal. These were separate kingdoms. It's under Isabella and Ferdinand. Isabella was the queen of Castile, uh, Ferd which was the biggest area, and Ferdinand was the king of Aragon. And when these two married, they had the largest kingdom. They were able to unify their resources. They stopped fighting each other, uh, which was a huge benefit. And they tied themselves together with a with a kingdom. But I wouldn't call it a nation in any way. For the way. record, by the way, this map is from the Roman era. It's just I wanted to show the shape of the Iberian Peninsula because it's still a large land mass, land mass that was under uh, a now pair it of was rulers. Under, now it was under a, a single, uh, the rule of a single couple. Um, I'm going to argue with you about France because France had a highly centralized government after Philip Augustus uh, in the 12th century. And so France, they might have on occasion had some weak rulers. The Capetian dynasties were still fairly strong. Uh, they did have a couple of... <laughs> Uh, rotten ones, but they all do. Uh, they during the Hundred Years' War, you did have a problem with the Burgundians who were on the same side as the English. Okay, but in 1492, I'm 1492 qualify this a more, yeah. there was no state that had its acts together better than Spain in Western Europe. China, we're not talking about, right? But they were able to do things like, for example, they were able to actually meet with this guy, this Italian guy, one of the Columbus brothers. This is a very famous painting. Um, and listen to what he said. Now, so this is, of course, Columbus appearing before Ferdinand and Isabella. It's a very fancified picture. This is a really more contemporary picture of Ferdinand. And this is more contemporary picture of Isabella. So as you can see, their real mission was sending Columbus out to see if he could find them some chins. No, no. <laughs> well, <laughs> certainly he was them. trying to get them to China. No. Um. <laughs> All right. So, uh, hey, we're trying to okay. be educational here. All right. So, so of course, the Spanish couldn't go south because the Spanish could not go south. We mentioned this last week. They had a treaty with Portugal right. that limited them from going south. So Portugal had trade with Asia at this point. Portugal was yeah. taking over the world. So, in many ways, what the Reconquista did was it brought Spain into the picture. If Spain right. hadn't been there, I don't think there's any question that Portugal would have made it to right. the Americas. They Portugal first went to America in what, 1502? For first, first explorers. 1500, yes. 1500, that's, that's only eight years after right. Columbus. Right. Uh, we had in England, John Cabot, who was also, um, also an Italian. Italian. Cabot, um, I don't Cabatini. Cabatini, okay. Um, 
you know, was, was pushing, saying, let's go north, let's go explore this North American thing. But England was so tied up with the War of the Roses. And that's what I'm saying. They could not get their act together, but and, Spain could. Yes. And England had another problem. England had the tides working against it. The, the tidal uh, movement in the North Atlantic is clockwise, which favored the Spaniards coming out of Spain, heading south and using the tides to go up, which out of England, they had to go south. And of course, if they went too far south, boom, they hit Spain. So um, it was not a favorable way of sailing. There is some evidence, um, again, I, I hate that phrase, but there's mm -hmm. some evidence that there were English fishermen who had been to no Newfoundland at this time. They right. didn't land, but they found the Great Banks of Newfoundland had mm -hmm. tremendous fishing resources and they were yeah. bringing them in. Right. So and, the, and there they was were, a way over. Right, and there was only, and they were only 500 years after but Vikings. they didn't have... <laughs> North America did not have the readily available resources that Latin America, what we now call Latin America, did. Well, it, so, was, it depended on the resources they were looking for. Spice, money. Gold. Gold, yeah. Silver. What spice do you got in North America? And, what spice do, what do you got in Virginia? Bad traffic. Bad traffic. Sorry. Really bad <laughs> traffic. Okay. But, you know, so the question is, that one of the side effects of the Reconquista was the Spanish were able to explore the Americas. Now, there's a debate. I don't know if you saw this. It was a news story today that the University of Notre Dame has got mm -hmm. some beautiful paintings of Columbus. No. Oh, okay. That they have agreed to cover over, put drapes over so that nobody can see them. Beautiful murals in their main hall. Yeah. But Columbus was not very good with the indigenous Americans. I would argue that anyone from Europe who came to North America would have brought pestilence, smallpox, disease, Greed, and death. Theft. Well, yeah. And slavery. Yeah. And slave. Well, okay. Did the Portuguese well, have slaves? Yes. Okay, and the, the Spanish Portuguese, obviously had slaves. The Portuguese started the slave trade to, to furnish their um, sugar plantations in the Azores and the Canary Islands. So, so they had already started bringing in slaves. So in many ways, the... Okay, the exploitation was going to happen. The exploitation whether was, it there, was, was going to happen. Whether it was the things. Italians who went to... Italy, sorry, the right. Italians who went to Spain, the Italians who went to Portugal, the, the Italians, Italians who went, who went to, to England, England, the Italians who were going to lead whoever to yeah. dominate the society for the next right. hundred years, yes. which they did. And this is the beginning of the Spanish Golden Age. But it's important to note, when the Spanish come to the New World, it's under a completely different system than, say, the, uh, the English. When the Spanish come, it is to colonize for the king and queen. They were under government control. They were being sponsored by the government and all of the profits came back to the king and queen. And you had this glorious explosion of art and architecture and even literature, Cervantes, all of this happening in the wake mm -hmm. of the wealth that came from the new world. Right. So what I think we've kind of established here is, you know, the Reconquista meant that, and a group of coincidences, mm -hmm. meant that it was Spain that dominated Latin America and Spain that got the wealth, but we could have had the Portuguese empire. It could have very easily have been the Portuguese. England really didn't get their act together for another 100 is, years. England is not going to get their act together until 1609 when they get to Jamestown, of course. Okay. Well, and But that was... An extent and, different. The, and the Spaniards had huge cities and by 16. And here's the other thing. When the English come, the English do not come uh, as a project of the queen or king at the time. They come as limited partnerships. Didn't the French have limited partnerships? Hudson's Bay Company wasn't yes, that long after that this. Is going That's the to French. Be, the French are going, to, are, are going to set up limited, limited partnerships, but they're mainly controlled by Louis XIV. The, the and the Cardinal. And the Cardinal. The Richelieu. Car Richelieu founded, yeah, Richelieu. Richelieu founded right. the Hudson's Bay Company. Yeah. It was used to be, if you went to Canada, they used to have on the Hudson's Bay department stores a little sign, founded by Cardinal Richelieu in 16... Blah, blah, blah. Well, <laughs> yeah, because um, uh, Henry, Henry of Navarre, when he dies, Richelieu takes over. Okay. I, I read the book. I saw the movie yeah. with Leonardo DiCaprio. And, and, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 or, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Three Musketeers time. Okay. Uh, and then Mazarin 
comes in and 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 then Louis the Fourteenth okay. takes over. So what I think we've established and we kind of realized is the, on the question of the effects of the Reconquista, it meant that it was Spain that dominated the New World. Right. But probably, and again, counterfactual history is terribly dangerous. Probably things wouldn't have been that different, except we, you know, if the English had gotten here first, we'd all be speaking English now. Could have been. Okay. But let's talk about some of the other effects of the Reconquista. You've got the Golden Age of Art. You've got Diego Velasquez. I had right. a picture of his. I haven't found it yet. I'm going to pull up. And you had the development of what was probably one of the most intolerant societies in the history of Western Europe. Yes. She's going to let me get away this with is, that one. No, I'm, I'm going to let you get away with that. I'm not going to let you. Well, uh, anyway. Right. Because Ferdinand and Isabella take Granada and Spain is theirs in January of 1492. Mm -hmm. They've got control over it. By March, we have the Alhambra degree, March of that year, in which they kick all the Jews out of Spain. Well, they didn't kick them out. They gave them a simple opportunity okay. they well, could they convert. Gave, yes, they gave them the choice, convert to Christianity Exile themselves. Oh, and by the way, you have to leave your gold and jewels and property in Spain. That becomes property of the crown. Or, or they could be sold into slavery. Right. That was an option. This is a choice. <laughs> this is not a good choice. But, and one of the things that happens is that a huge number, estimated around 200,000 people, converted to Christianity, of right. Jew Jews. Right. And don't, don't go too far forward. Don't go too far forward in that story because. Spain was one of the last places Jews could be in Europe. By 1230, there were places the English, in Germany where they could. The English had thrown them out a hundred years, couple of hundred fifty years before. Almost hundred fifty years before, much the of France French had thrown, had them, thrown out. them out. They had been thrown out from much of the Italian peninsula. They were in backwater places in Eastern Europe, um, and they had moved into northern North Africa. Uh, that was one of the places they had gone. They found a uh, very okay. fertile ground in Egypt. Okay. So, uh, but nonetheless, the huge quantity of Jews who probably may or may not have been that religious. This is something that I cannot find evidence of. How many of them were sincerely converting? How many of them were like, yeah, whatever, business is business. You know, yeah. um, sorry about that. But we don't know. We do know that they did promise to allow the Muslims could live their lives in peace and harmony under the new Christian regime. And that happened, and that lasted eight years. Eight years. <laughs> uh, until the one of the insidious things of the Reconquista and why they emphasize conquista, uh, which would have been the Spanish word for for what they would have used it for the Crusades. And so this idea of uh, doing this work to get rid of people, uh, to get rid of people who are not the same religion as you are is is kind of bothersome, kind of kind of scary. Okay, um, we but need to get off of that edge. Oh, sorry, we need to come back live. That's right. Sorry, we're still looking at Ferdy and Izzy, um, Isabella with a headache there. Oh, and you're drinking out of a sloth cup. All right. So, um, and then then obviously they, we we mentioned this briefly last week. Mm -hmm. They promised the Muslims freedom. The Muslims wanted certain things, and and they basically said, fine, you're done. Now, the problem was you've got 200,000 people who are approximately Christians who had been Jews. Or Muslims. How, or Muslims. How do you tell if their conversion is sincere? Well, the Catholic Church had an interesting answer. Why not just ask them? Let's ask them. What would the, be the word for asking people? Simply? Let's inquire. Yeah, let's have, let's have a little uh, inquisition. inquisition. Okay. And and sadly, uh, the the whole rules of being inquisition yeah. inquisitioned. They weren't nice people. Okay. They weren't being nice. And I I'm going to suggest that this is the real negative of the inquisition. Yes, the Muslim rulers were at times intolerant. Yes, there were at times pogroms. Yes, they did round up Christians and sell them into slavery at times over their 700 years history. Right. But in a unified Spain. Mm -hmm. Ferdinand and Isabella said, we are going to have a unified country that is not only Christian, it is our version of Christian. Right. And 
Okay, the Inquisition by law could only affect Christians. They could not right. affect anybody else. Exactly. You had to be baptized, then you were allowed to torture to find out the confession and right. so on. Right, yeah, the, 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 I, the, the questioning was, of course, done not so nicely to begin with, and then they proceeded on to torture uh, with the idea that these people would tell the truth uh, under pain. And yeah, it didn't work. Okay, so but I so, wanted to. But, but but here is one of the more important things to remember: the Spanish Inquisition and the Church was allowed to question these people. It was allowed to question them under torture, but they were not allowed to punish them. The torture was questioning; it was not punishment. If they were found to be uh, unrepentant, if they were found to be still practicing uh, Islam or practicing Judaism, then they were handed over to the secular authorities and killed or sold into slavery or whatever. Have you ever read the theory that Columbus was a Murano, which is, of course, uh, was a pejorative for swine? That's something right. for which was a pejorative for the. Mm -hmm. Ray Conversos. Yeah. Um, the... Okay. Yes. Anyway, we're, we're, we're getting bogged down. But the point is, yeah. this led to, and by the way, after about 1520, the Inquisition did include Protestants. Right. Because, and there were Protestants. Okay. One of the things, and this is one of the positive aspects of the Inquisition, Protestantism never took hold in Spain, and it did in almost every other country in Europe. At this certainly, time. certainly in France, it took a big hold. Yes. And Germany, of course. Oh, yeah. Uh, German and, lands, yeah. But uh, and never in Italy. One of the reasons that you didn't have Protestantism and the Reformation taking hold in, in Spain was because of the work of this man. This is Mr. Jimenez de Cisneros. He was a very strange, very sincere Catholic um, who basically felt it was his duty to create a perfect Christian state. And no to anybody with government intentions. Don't create a monolithic religion state. It doesn't work out well. Cisneros, yeah. one of the first things that he did was he burned the libraries mm -hmm. at um, the Alhambra. No, which, the libraries at Cordoba. Mm, yes. I think your details are wrong. Okay. Anyway, he burned, according to sources, thousands and thousands of volumes, which may have include lost writings of Aristotle. A lot sure. of things are lost forever. Because yeah, it, was, it could have been as eventful as the burning of the libraries of Alexandria or the burning of the libraries of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, that quantity of information of one-of-a-kind books uh, that were lost, tossed to the flames. Yes, um, and of course printing did exist in the 1490s, but it was in its rudimentary forms and right. there, there wasn't a lot done. So we had the development of this purified state, right. which continued. And of course, later they said you had to, to be a Christian, you had to be a first generation, or you couldn't be first generation. Mm -hmm. um, they threw, if you had been converted, if your grandparents had been Muslim, you were thrown out by the 1620s. Right. So we had this growth of intolerance. Was this an inevitable result of the Reconquista? Didn't have to be. I think it did. I, I think, think it was inevitable because part of the Reconquista was saying we're going to retake this entire country. We're going to create a perfect country. And, of course, right. the Pope rewarded them. He named them Ferdinand and Isabel, yes. the most Catholic kings. The most Catholic monarch. Isabella was named Servant of God in 1974. She was on her way to sainthood. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's going to happen now. Now. Uh, we're now a little more sensitive to the atrocities that were done to indigenous Americans. Right. For the record, Isabella was somewhat progressive about the Native Americans because you can't torture them because they're not Christians yet. You can't have an inquisition. She said, these are subjects. Right. Now, subsequent rulers said, these are slaves. This yeah. is great. There's a wonderful debate that we can talk about if mm -hmm. I had my notes here that happened about 40 years later on the question of, is it okay to enslave Right. Indigenous Native Americans. Americans. Yeah. And ultimately they appeared to decide, no, it really wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so they did the logical thing, which was they round up slaves from Africa. Right. And. Got to get your slaves from somewhere. Also, 
we don't talk about this in history too much, but the vast majority of African slaves in the New World went to Latin America. Yes. One of the reasons we don't talk about that is because it can lead to people saying, well, America wasn't so bad because they killed a lot more in Brazil. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Doesn't, doesn't we don't rate our atrocities from one to ten. You're all and, six. Yeah, and, <laughs> and when you start looking into the transatlantic slave trade and you begin to find out that they expected to lose something like half of the slaves just on the journey. That it was the the numbers are mind boggling. So yes, Frank uh, Henry VIII was declared a defender of the faith by that Roman guy. It was a slightly later Roman guy, but of course. Um, well, yeah, okay. Well, gee, if you want to get in, if you want to get into Henry VIII and what he did to to Christianity, but yeah, Henry VIII was was very much against Martin Luther. Henry VIII wrote a book uh, defending the Catholic Church and. And castigating Martin Luther. And, and Martin Luther wrote a letter uh, basically called On Henry and His Errors. And, his and he errors. basically said, he is covered, and it was written in Latin. So yes. I, when I see the, the wording translated. It basically says, he has covered himself in the filth of humans and animals. Yes. Which I think probably was intended a little more crudely. Yeah, I, I, I it's, it's the only time I get to say shit in class. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Have we covered the uh, Inquisition? So where are we on, on the issue of the Reconquista? Good thing, bad thing? Um, one of the things is, so I resent the attitude which was taken by Washington Irving and others that says, oh, this wonderful, glorious land, and because they were just as barbaric. The, yeah. the Moors in Spain were just as barbaric as the Christians in Germany and France at that time. But they did show that, yes, you could have multiple confessions in the same there location. There were times there was a Jewish was a vizier okay. who, ran the, who right. ran the kingdom of Cordoba. He was very effective. He actually led the siege on the city of Seville for the caliph of Cordoba. Mm -hmm. His uh, vizier was named Samuel. However, afterwards... He died. His son took over. They crucified him. They killed all the Jews in Granada. Right. There were there were pogroms throughout, and so the Muslims in Spain don't get a pass. The Christians in Spain don't get a pass. Well, it's the 15th century. We're all barbarians. Yeah. Well, but it was the 15th century, and we are talking about a society that was led by monarchs, that was led by people who basically could make any, pretty much any rule they wanted. And so the idea that you could have a somewhat peaceful time, a time where people got along together, that uh, uh, the society was enriched somewhat, you could have enlightened despots. Uh, but, well, they didn't call them enlightened despots, but you could also have real stinkers. Okay, but one of the things, and again, in next week, we're going to be talking about something that involves Irish in America. Right. And one of the things is that the Irish talked about their conditions, which were not fair. They were bad, they were, but they were never any worse than the conditions. Ne never, you know, they were comparable to the conditions in the best of times for the Christians under Umayyad Spain. Right. So it's, it's like they were always second-class citizens. So what I'm saying is the Christians don't get a pass. The Muslims, the Muslims don't, don't get, get a pass. pass. The, the Jews, Jews ran the country for about 70 years. Yeah. I haven't found evidence of atrocities there. There probably are. But. but my point is this. It wasn't that the particular monarch was Jewish, the particular monarch was Christian, or that the particular monarch was Muslim. It was the sensibility, the morality, and the effort of individual monarchs to make their place good or bad. That they had that kind of power in their hands. And we don't have that kind of power now. Well, China does. Yeah, the authoritarian... No, this is, this is something we're starting to see. Okay, back, yeah. we've got... You've got an authoritarian state in China, right. and you're seeing, especially compared to where China was... 40 years ago, you're seeing tremendous progress. In Spain, you saw tremendous progress. Right. Spain explored the new world. Mm -hmm. China is exploring the moon. Right. Okay. A totalitarian, intolerant state can accomplish a tremendous amount. Yes, because they don't have to deal with things like NIMBY. 
Yes. Not in my backyard. They don't, they can trample on rights. They can tell people we're going to do this now. Autocracy, in other words, being an autocrat, you can do things. I mean, it, it, the world opens up for you. It's just okay, not but, a world well, for everybody. One of the things is most despots end up becoming corrupt and they end right, up going yeah. things. But this is a question that we haven't addressed. If, and this is a big qualifier, right. you were a devout Catholic living in Spain in 1492 or 1493, mm -hmm. was life better, worse, or the same after the Reconquista than before? After 1492, um, the economics of finding the new world, I mean, let alone the mental uh, uh, craziness of finding a new world that the Bible didn't mention, what? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, we could, do, I'd love to do a whole detailed show on that, on, on the impact. When they found silver in Bolivia, when they started bringing silver out by the ton, by an, an unimaginable amount of money coming out of Bolivia, coming to Spain. It wasn't going to everybody in Spain. It was just going to the crowned heads. Everything went through them. And so what happens is that Spain actually suffers inflation. There was this huge influx of money. When is this? This is like 1530s, this 1540s? Is, this is 1550s, 1560s. Now, at the same time, you've got King Charles right. is kidnapping the Pope. Right. Uh, it's later. Okay. Uh, but, but I mean, but the influx of money, the one thing they wanted the most, they got their wish, and it, it turned Spain into a backwater. Really? Yeah. That fast? Okay. But well, one took, of the things, when I, I brought years, back yeah. to the case of, you know, okay, was the Reconquista good for Jews? No. no. Was it good for Muslims? No. no. Was it good for the Christians in Spain, the Catholic Christians who had the particular orthodoxy that Isabel and Ferdinand embraced? I think it was, if only because we weren't fighting any more stupid wars for a yeah. while. <laughs> yeah. The attention went, went away from fighting these wars. Also, if you were a minor nobleman and had helped out Ferdinand and Isabella, had been on their side... The smartest thing when a monarch gets a hold of new land is to divvy it up and give it to their followers. Caesar did that. Yeah, Caesar does that. Uh, that endless numbers of very good rulers throughout time do that uh, because it creates a whole class of nobles that is beholden to you. And so in that way, you've got more people becoming enriched because of this. But did the af, you know did the spanish i don't think the spaniards ever reclaimed the glory that was muslim spain you know this again this is i, I showed this last week but i just love this that's why i'm making you guys watch yeah. it again well, this is the uh mesquita combination mosque and church in cordoba and remember you got into an argument with a guy in a sidewalk cafe about <laughs> were things better under Francisco Franco? Which um, is not really a debate. No! Yeah. <laughs> well, he was saying that it was, but I mean, it was, it was the same kind of better that we actually saw in the Soviet Union in that, A, everybody had a job, wasn't the job they wanted, but everyone had a job, and B, everyone had a place to live. It might have been the not, not the place they wanted to live, but they had it. So the idea of taking care of these creature comforts, um, you know, it's it, it depends on your standard, your personal standard of what you want in your life. Okay, well, it's... 1492. I really want a warm place to sleep. A warm, steady warm food, place to steady meals. Yeah, I want. Uh, I, you know, I want to be left alone to tend my olive trees. Yeah, you know, and that's and and my uh, and my orange orchard, and that's all I want to do, and just keep keep bringing all of these things to the forefront. And really, when you're talking about peasants, when I do my lectures about history, and I talk about uh, going through the Middle Ages, and I talk about the development of the Gothic, uh, the
the Gothic cathedrals and I talk about the development of the universities and then we go on to the Renaissance and the great art and the, the scientific revolution going on and on and on. If you were a peasant scratching your life out in the dirt and that had been what your family had done for hundreds of years, your life was not changed in a radical way not until after the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution. Um, you had pretty much, your same life was been the okay. same as but, your ancestors. And again, after the Reconquista in Spain, right. you had potatoes. Yeah. You had yeah. tomato sauce. You could make pasta. Yes. With properly. Yes, properly. <laughs> but yeah, no, no, no. Had... you had this influx of stuff, this influx of ideas. Corn, and, peppers. Okay, so one of the things we established, I think, that right. somebody else... Uh, the Tobacco. No. Somebody else would have made it to America. America would have been developed and exploited. The Native Americans would have still been slaughtered and enslaved and treated horrendously. And die of diseases. Yes. The same, you know... Okay, but... Your, your average, that you're... Spanish conquistador had the same disease. This is where we get back to the Notre Dame thing. The yeah. Notre Dame covered over this, these artwork because they said, right. well, it's insensitive to Native Americans. Right. And they were kind of showing these people, oh, look, brave white man bringing us religion. Mm, this is good. Yeah. Um, but the influx of discovery, new ideas, new technologies, um, just the wealth of new cultures, new understanding was tremendously beneficial for society. And I'm going to argue that even though if Ferdinand and Isabella established a pure, hard-boiled theocracy, no mercy, no tolerance of other ideas, the discovery of another culture, of other religions, of people who'd never even heard of your whole Judeo-Christian tradition, this opened up the world and this ultimately broke the stranglehold of Christianity on European society. Okay. Our Catholicism. I'm Ultimately, gonna, all of it. Okay, I'm going to argue the other side of it because you've got 1500, you've got Spain as Catholic, the Italian peninsula is Catholic, France, a lot of it is Catholic. Uh, it's only in the German lowlands and then eventually in England that you start getting Protestantism. France. Uh, small areas of France. Massive quantities in France. Anyway, go keep going. Anyway, keep going. Okay, my point is this: it takes you another three hundred years almost to start the Industrial Revolution, to start something different than what had been there. How long did it take? Okay, so so what I, what I'm basically trying to say is this: the Industrial Revolution is not going to start in a Catholic country. Okay, thank you, Max Weber. Yeah, well, but they're also not going to start uh, the the ideas of the geocentric. I think that's, that's the, dangerous. The, the, that position the is dangerous. The heliocentric uh, Earth. I'm coming to that. I'm going to challenge you on this. Okay. okay. First off, saying yeah. that it wouldn't start in a Catholic country, be careful. That that that's kind of like a little bit whiggish, thinking it came from this. Let me well, let me go back to, okay. to my other issue. I'm, so right. we've got this discovery of other continents, of other land masses, of people that aren't mentioned in the Bible. One of the big upsets was the Bible seemed to mention four races of people, and these native people they weren't were, on the list. Yeah, they aren't on the list. So this upsets, and I'm going to suggest to you that after this kind of mind-bending stuff comes, comes around, people are suddenly saying, well, maybe other interpretations we have of religion aren't so valid. And it wasn't that long after 1492 that you had Copernicus saying, Right. Maybe we should rethink this. Now, yes, there had been heliocentric models before. No, let me. The perfect all knowledge, including all scientific knowledge, can be found in a single religious source, and they have always been right, was no longer valid right. because of the fact that we found stuff that seemed to contradict okay. the Bible, at least as we've interpreted it. All right, hang on. Copernicus, let's talk. Copernicus was hired by the Catholic Church to get the calendar back on track. Yes. Because uh, that that little quarter of a day was not fully a quarter of a day. So by putting two... For the benefit years, of anybody who's who's not, not up on this, the Julian calendar was established by 
Julius Caesar. Actually, people working for Julius Caesar. Before yeah. that, a, day, a year ended whenever the emperor said it did. Right. They had done the math and they said there's 365 and a quarter, and days, a quarter days. So we're going to have a leap year every four right. years. Right. Everything seemed to work fine. Turns out their math was a little bit off. There's little actually 365.2412 something yeah, days. It, it's, it, it, it is enough that from year to year to year, you would not notice it. After a century or two, then you start noticing Or 15. It. After 15 centuries, you're two weeks off. Okay, which is exactly what happened. It was basically the Pope and his, the royal, I'm sorry, the Vatican astronomers said Vatican there's astronomers. something wrong. Right. The sun, where we say the vernal equinox, right. stuff is in the right position. The days are still getting longer after the vernal right. equinox. Right? No, the vernal solstice. Sorry. Anyway, days no, are still vernal getting... Equinox. Days are still getting longer after the summer solstice. Right. Okay. There you go. They're not supposed to. Something is wrong. Okay. Okay. So, yes, Copernicus was one of several people who was sent to investigate this. Right. But nonetheless, he was willing to think outside the box mm -hmm. because during this period, during the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages, during the Dark Ages, I get in trouble for saying that, by the way. He does. Um, <laughs> This is the Bible. This is the way the Bible has been interpreted right. by the church for centuries. We don't question this. And the centuries of dogma. Right. That's piled on top of that. But what I'm suggesting to you, and this is mainly just me being a little bit competitive for sport, okay. is once you've got this other continent, once you've got this other world, this whole, everything that is not based on here, suddenly you're able to question other things. And I'm going to suggest that that kind of rethinking. Yes, Copernicus was hired by the Catholic Church. Okay. He was a priest, but it would No, he wasn't. No, a he priest. wasn't a priest. He just never married. He was Yeah, he was a, he was a churchman. Okay. Uh, he he worked for the church. Okay. Okay. But but you have All right. the willingness to challenge very okay. standardized okay. dogma. 1543 Copernicus publishes his book. 1543 Copernicus dies. Copernicus didn't have his book published I don't think during his lifetime. Uh, it was months before he died. It was, it was months, months before, before he died. Yeah. Copernicus had written much of it mm -hmm. 30 years before right. and was debating it. One of the things that we know... But hey, he wouldn't I, publish. He wouldn't publish. He was bothered by it. It was upsetting to him because he's challenging what the church has said for 1,500 years. Right. One of Copernicus's critics, and I love this story, was a gentleman named Martin Luther who mm -hmm. said, he's a nut job. The Bible says the earth goes around the sun. The earth goes around the sun. We're done. But I'm suggesting that this no, is... No, 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 The sun goes, sun goes around, around the earth. earth. I know. I mean, yeah, right? What goes around comes around. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm, I'm, I do think that I could make the case that the church was no longer right on everything. Now, they'd just been oh, through 150 years before they had a little problem with all the prayers in the world didn't prevent the plague. Right. But you also had Galileo. Not yet. 1600. Yes. 1543. Copernicus dies, 1600, Galileo. At the same time, before 1600, you have Tycho Brahe, yeah. um, who's doing all of his observations uh, in Denmark. Tycho Brahe's uh, conception of the cosmos is one of the weirdest ones you can imagine. He has the Earth. He has the moon going around the Earth. Then he has the sun. And he has all the planets. Mars, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, and then the rest of the stars all going around the sun, and then the sun goes around the Earth. It is bizarre, and Gotta it almost the works. Work. Got to make the numbers it, work. It, the, the numbers almost work. However, Galilei, uh, 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 Tycho Brahe was not the great mathematician. He hires a mathematician, Johannes Kepler. Now, Kepler is a far better mathematician. Okay. But anyway, we're way off topic. No, but what I'm <laughs> saying is this: Tycho Brahe, Catholic; Galileo, Catholic. Both of them. Kepler, Protestant. Kepler, Protestant. Kepler is the one who publishes the work. Okay. Kepler's the one who changes this this whole. There are. I'm not sure where you're going because right. there are a lot of very intolerant Protestants <laughs> and and very close-minded. In fact, right. the modern uh, creation-only movement is very much Protestant centric. Right. And Notre Dame, which I was just talking about, one, they're being sensitive. Mm -hmm. Two, they do real science there. Right. It's a really, you, you, you will. 
get more respect out of a degree from Notre Dame than you will from Oral Roberts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did I ever tell you about the time when I went to a I went to a conference of of whoops I went to a conference of uh, medieval historians uh, and other people who study medieval literature in Kalamazoo, Michigan. It happens every May. It's a it's a big conference. It's a lot of fun. But when you get medievalists together, it gets kind of interesting. I was at a cocktail party. They start building party. trebuchets out of plastic yeah. spoons. And well, I was at a cocktail party, and you had uh, scholars from Notre Dame and scholars from Washington University in St. Louis, and they were there telling jokes in Latin. It was bizarre, and and I finally they were laughing so hard I had to ask what did you, you know what was the joke and he was talking about a scribe who had written down um written down this the sin of bestiality and he had gone through and kept listing all of the animals that this was practiced on and then he, at the bottom of the list he writes however this sin is rarely practiced on tigers <laughs> This is a real document? Yes, this is a real document. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Um, so if we if we were to create a score, going back to our original topic, which was Reconquista. Oh, must we? Good or bad. Just, just let me All wrap right. this up. All then right. I want to talk about something else. But so the bad, okay. Um, Intolerance. The Spanish Inquisition. Death. Pain, death, death of tens of millions of people. Destruction of cultures. Right. Again, then this is, of course... In the Western Hemisphere, right within Spain, you've got the religious intolerance, and you've got the throwing out of the smart people. Right, um, the very learned Muslims and Jews were driven out of the country, and yeah. also the ones who were questioning the religion right. were driven out. So you don't see a lot of scientific discoveries. You were talking about Galileo, mm -hmm. uh, Kepler, Copernicus. Mm -hmm. None of these people are Spanish. No, and I do think you need a diversity of opinions right. to get creative thought. Okay. So these are some negatives. We've sure. also got the upsetting of the traditional views of science and everything based mm -hmm. on the biblical things. We've got the introduction of foods, which, um, in a, you know, you, you've got the development of technologies. You've got um, the need to develop methods of transporting food, people along distances, new right. navigation technologies developed, and the foodstuffs, mm -hmm. you know, so... Positive, negative aspects of the Reconquista. How do you think? Mm -mm. She says no. No. Okay. Uh, no, I think I think it it um, the idea that we have to have a pure kingdom is offensive. And the amount but, of bad is hey, always I am the good. a product of twentieth century America, in which we have multi. Uh, multi-dimensional sorts of country, a uh, country with all sorts of different uh, confessionals. And in it. today we have brilliant scientists right. who are Protestants, Jews, Catholics, and Muslims, and, and I, Hindus, and yeah, a and, lot of Hindus in this in this country. And <laughs> Jane, yeah, yeah okay. you know, uh, the list is is. So I, I, again, most. I don't think the religion yeah. is incompatible, but I do think intolerance is probably incompatible. Yeah, I think I, I think the problem here is intolerance. I think I think the idea of killing somebody for beliefs, um, especially because beliefs are deeply held. What if they're Dallas Cowboys fans? Oh, who cares? Okay. <laughs> All right. So I think we're Dallas Cowboys. Okay. Um, okay. Did you want to talk about? I, I'm going to talk a little bit about our next show. I want to talk about. Our I also next would show. love to get some feedback from uh, people sure. about this is unusual in us being this unprepared and unscripted and just rambling. I don't know if it works or not. So I'd love to hear from yeah. some of you folks out there in video land. All 13 of you. <laughs> yeah, right. um, but did you have anything else or shall I start talking about? Talk, go, go on to the next. Well, next week I want to do a uh, talk about the subject of Tammany Hall. Right. And Tammany Hall is interesting because, um, well, it's interesting for a number of things, but one of the curious aspects is when we were in high school, we heard about Tammany Hall. We saw those kind of cartoons uh, with tigers, with boss tweed and all this. And we were told Tammany was bad. They were corrupt. Uh, let's get rid 
of Tammany Hall. And that Here's was one by big... Dr. Seuss, by the way. Really? Yeah, actually, you don't see the caption, but it's, it's uh, or is it there? It says, vote early, vote often. Okay. Um, which is actually, well, it was a saying that was around before. But the issue of Tammany Hall is, and uh, there's been a little bit of recent scholarship on this, but corrupt, evil, enemy of democracy. Yeah. It allowed recent immigrants who were Catholic from different countries who were being oppressed to have a voice in government. Uh, it introduced them to democracy. It brought them into a system. Um, the spoil system of Tammany did lead to tremendous corruption, right. which, of course, ultimately led to the need to corrupt, fix a system that had been corrupt for 100 years before. The ten, they, but Tammany did raise it to new levels. Yes, but you're also fighting against the um, system. What What is the term? Starts Oils? with a P. No, 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 no. Patronage? Start, patronage, yes. Uh, the patronage system that was rampant in government, especially during the uh, during the um, uh, after World War, uh, after the Civil War, was that if you had a high enough government position, you gave away jobs, you gave away postmaster jobs, and all sorts of these hundreds and hundreds of jobs. Okay, Tammany. Oops. And no. Tammany fought against that. Okay, but I wanted to, so the question is, you know, was Tammany right. good? Because, okay, so these immigrants had only, this was their only voice. And much of what you've seen, like these Thomas Nast cartoons. Right. Um, we Bostweed. don't talk about, Bostweed, by the way, was Protestant. Yeah. There were a handful of Protestant leaders. The Tammany was essentially, and we're going to get into this in a great deal, the democratic machine. But uh, Thomas Nast was also passionately anti-Catholic. Yep. And many of his drawings were basically part of the whole movement of, this is a picture of Columbia stopping a mad Irishman and the caption under it is Bravo, Bravo. Um, Harper's Weekly, yes, Harper's Today is a very liberal pro publication, but at the time they were so extremely anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic. Strong, strongly anti-Catholic. Strongly anti-immigrant. And when we're talking about Catholic immigrants, we're talking about, of course, Italians. Originally. Sicilians. Not. That's later. Um, uh, Eastern Europe, Poles, Slavic people. But and and originally it was the Irish. Irish. The Irish. And the Irish is, and anyway, so I want to have a, do some research and have a talk about this. We're going right. to be a little more prepared. We get to, we get to spend all, all week looking at cartoons. <laughs> And I love to hear what other people have to say about it. But essentially, um, one of the things you now, so we're going to vilify Thomas Nast, but I'm increasingly saying <sighs> you look at historical characters and you're going to find some dirt almost everywhere. Yeah, they all have dirt underneath their nails. And Thomas Nast was a champion of rights for African Americans, for Hispanic immigrants on the West Coast, mm -hmm. for Asian immigrants. Asian but, immigrants, yes. But he hated the Irish. Right. Yeah. And it's it is an interesting, it's interesting to look at some of the divisions that were happening at the time because we're talking about the Transcontinental Railroad and the Irish working on that. And and the Chinese. In one way, and the Chinese working yeah. on it in the other way. So talk a little bit about But the, the Tammany gave people a lot of power. And many right. people said too much power. Mm -hmm. And the reforms which led, which ultimately led to the bogus election of a president uh, and the most the most unfair presidential election in history was a direct outgrowth of Tammany Hall. Right. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. The ending, and this is, I'm, I'm just what? teasing. The ending of Reconstruction yes. was done basically as part of a plot to destroy Tammany Hall. Right. So anyway, yeah. so there's a lot there. We're going to talk about that. I think we're going to wrap this up. It's a it's a it's a fun little piece of American history, and and we need to do American history uh, yeah. for right now. Um, actually, I think before we quit, does anybody uh, have questions? Uh, Questions in the Mr. live chat. You over there, yes. I'll pay you back at the end of the month. I told you that, okay? Oh, sorry. Anyway, um, definitely, uh, if you're watching this later, send us... Uh, post comments. Post comments, 
And if you've got questions or if you maybe have a time period that you'd like us to look into. We do have a list of topics coming up. But we have a, a list. What kind of topics are we going to talking about, Jerry? Well, I want still want to do the French Revolution. Still want to do the French Revolution. And yep. the Age of Enlightenment. Yep. I definitely want to do the 1939 World's Fair and the yes. future we didn't get. Yes. The future we didn't get. Where is my hovercraft? Uh, hover, hover, uh, my jetpack. Jet Where's my jetpack? Your hovercraft is outside and it's full of eels. Yes. Um, anyway, so I think that's about it. Okay. Um, okay. Are we done? Oh, Frank, okay. we've, yeah. Where is my flying cart? Um, contributed to the black legend. What's that? What black legend, Frank? I don't know. Um, how much of the anti-Reconquista stuff can be attributed to the Black Legend? I don't know what the Black Legend is. I don't know the, the phrase is. Black Legend. No. Um, you got us. Well, cool. Seafield comment. What's he saying? What is the Black Flying car. Oops. The Black... Okay. I'm, unfortunately, we have like this 25-second delay. So Frank just posed an interesting question. Frank Martinez out there, who is a historian and scholar himself. Yes. Um, oh, Frank, congratulations now that old Shasta is being reopened after the car fire. Yeah. Okay. So we go. Okay. All right. We're just filling time and we're boring people. Yeah. Well. Want to see my scar? No. Oh. <laughs> um, but definitely want to uh, La Leyenda Negra. La Leyenda, La Leyenda Negra. Well, Frank, I'm going to go read about that, and we'll have some talking. Mr. Google here. Uh, right. We're going to have to look. What else have, What else did we want to look at? Oh, feedback. We want to look at Nothing feedback. more than feedback. feedback. Oh, All right. God, I'm, sing. I'm going to call this a night, and okay. uh, we're going to wrap it up. and Say thank anyway, you, everybody. Hey, thank you for being here. Thank you for liking. Thank you for uh, spending your time with us. And the question is, can we do a show without the quite the amount of research we do every week. Uh, no. All right. No. We're going to say goodnight. Thank good you, night, ladies everybody. and gentlemen. Your check's in the mail.